Hi everybody. So this is a tutorial on Heisenberg uncertainty principle and this is Walter White from Breaking Bad who took in the alias Heisenberg if uh, you've never seen the show. So I'm going to start off with actually before I get into the note sheet I'm going to go to this YouTube clip that shows electrons passing through a double slits. Um, this I showed you before and as they pass through the double slits, if electrons were truly particles, then we would expect the pattern to develop is the electrons would show light up the screen, uh, essentially in line with the slit. And as this develops over time, and this is what's really interesting about this, beyond the wave nature of this, is these are one electron at a time passing through two slits, and yet they know how to create an interference pattern, which is very, very odd, but that's another discussion. Anyway, so as we see this interference pattern develop, we can only conclude that electrons have wavelength. And that wavelength uh, can be derived from de Broglie wavelength, and when you pass through double slits, it's not going to show its particle nature. It's going to show a wave nature. So the following lesson is going to talk about a profound implication, the fact that not only are waves wave-like, like photons or, or, or light, but so are particles. And that's the essence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, all right, so I'm going to pause there. So we're done with that. Let me make sure I can uh, escape out of this. Okay. So let's, now I'm going to turn to a PowerPoint presentation to kind of develop the Heisenberg uncertainty principle conceptually before we get into um, the mathematics of it. The mathematics are fairly minimal, um, but it's not always obvious how to apply them. So let me go through this PowerPoint presentation and let's see if we can make sense of this. Okay, so right here you see just a schematic of that double slit. You have electrons coming in, pass through double slit, and they create that interference pattern. But let's turn to waves because the uncertainty principle relies on a concept called complementarity. There are certain measurements that complement each other, which we're going to explain what that means in a second. So let me just make sure I know how to advance through this. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so let's go to slide two. So we already know the answer to this. Well, we got plane waves coming in. We have a slit of a particular width, and I'm going to call that X as, as opposed to D now. And we know that the what happens is when we pass through, we're going to get a diffraction pattern. Okay, now let's take a look at different diffraction patterns. If we have a wide gap, right, we're not going to get a whole lot of diffraction. In other words, if the gap is much larger uh, than the wavelength, we don't get a lot. And if the uh, gap is smaller or uh, on the order of magnitude of the wavelength, then you're going to get pronounced uh, diffraction. So we can narrow, we can look at that progress of the waves this way and the spreading this way at some angle as essentially proxies for two fundamental measurements of that wave and or particle. Okay, and that's what we're really going to focus on here, and this is the abstract part of it. All right, so I can unfortunately have to erase all the smart boards. So let's say that we have this gap width, and we're going to quantify as delta x, where delta represents an uncertainty. In other words, if I want to know where is the wave, it's somewhere between here and here. Okay, so there's some uncertainty in that delta x. Then we have another uncertainty that goes with it, and that is where does the particle go? So in other words, if it, the particle was here, we might expect it to go this way straight, but because of diffraction, it's, some of it's gonna diffract that way or that way, so there's an uncertainty where it's going. And that, how we measure the uncertainty where it's going is not so much velocity, but rather momentum. Because momentum, we want to include the mass part, because if there's anything acts on it, that momentum is ultimately what matters as opposed to velocity. So let me re reiterate, this is the key to understanding the uncertainty principle, at least from a classical standpoint. Again, we can say where is the particle. The where is the particle is dependent on how small we make the gap. If we have a large gap, we really don't know where any particular part of the wave is. If we have a really small gap, then we can narrow it 
much uh, smaller range. And then we also can talk about where does the particle or the wave go once it passes through the gap, and that's really uh, the diffraction angle, which we're going to liken to the, un the momentum, okay, where you, where you are and where you're going. Okay, so in this particular case, if we have a big gap, we have a high uncertainty in where the particle is. In other words, delta x is relatively large. However, we have a lower uncertainty or low uncertainty in where it's going, which is just basically a way of saying that there's a diffraction angle is fairly small. Okay, in other words, the range of possibilities is fairly small because it's roughly the same size as the gap. So, if we then change our gap, in other words, we make it smaller, we already know what's going to happen in terms of the diffraction, right? So if I have a arbitrarily small gap, my uncertainty in X is pretty small. I'm pretty sure I know where it is, but I get a large diffraction, so I get a large uncertainty in the momentum. So we get the reverse of what we saw before. Here we have a low uncertainty where it is, but that corresponds to a high uncertainty of where it's going. So what we're getting at is then ultimately, and this is fundamental to everything that is wave-like, wavelength, is that you have a fundamental uncertainty in two measurements. And these measurements are complementary. In this case, position and momentum are complementary, meaning that the less I know, the more I know of one, in other words, if this is small, the less I know of the other. Okay? So mathematically, multiplying not the actual measurements, but the uncertainty in the measurements must be a constant value. So a small delta x, meaning I know where it is, means I have a large delta p, means I'm not really sure where it's going, and vice versa. If I want to not know where it is, then I can know where it's going. And that's ultimately what the uncertainty principle is about. It is a feature of all waves, and since particles have wave-like properties, electrons, protons, then this also holds, holds for that. And that's uh, certainly not obvious. So... I'm now going to turn to the note sheet and kind of sum up this in a different way. Okay, so, and I've already talked about this. According to Broly, uh, there is no more a um, particle than it is a wave. It, they're both, it, it's, one or, it's one or the other, but it's not like nature prefers one over the other. And as such, uh, the hallmark properties of a particle, especially its position and its um, momentum, okay, start to become uh, poorly defined. Okay, so I'll go into that more. And then the upshot is, more specifically, the more precisely, okay, so that's precision, the uncertainty. One wants to measure the position, that's x, of the electron, the less precisely one knows where its momentum. And I was saying before, that's where it's going. So in a nutshell, basically, measuring where it is changes where it's going. Okay? And that's not what classical physics tells us. The act of observing something does not affect what it's doing. But we're saying it literally does this. I gave you the wave analogy. Now I'm going to give you another analogy based on the particle aspect of an electron. We can understand that. Okay, so take an electron, and let's say we're thought to be at rest relative to some lab, lab, for instance, lab frame, and we want to know exactly where it is. Okay, so we know there's an electron. We want to know where it is. Okay, so to lo locate where the electron is, you have to see it. Not necessarily with the eye, but with some instrument. In order to see it, we need to shine light on it. Okay. And then light needs to be the same size as the electron, otherwise it will diffract right around it. So that's classical. We've talked about that before. If I want to look at an object and get a lot of detail from it, my wavelengths of light have to be smaller than that. So what kind of wavelengths are we going to choose in order to see electrons? Well, we're going to go with the smallest possible because electrons are really small. So let's go with gamma photons or x-rays because they have a very short wavelength. Okay, so far so good. However, now this is where Planck's law comes in. 
we know that energy of a photon is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So we're going to have a lot of energy, those photons of light. And a consequence, they will collide, or I should, you know, they'll collide with the electrons, or they, yeah, I'm going to put that, I probably want a different term here, collide with the electron, okay? So by looking at the electron, you are changing what it's doing, all right? In other words, if that photon collect, remember, we had a stationary electron, we shine a gamma photon into a CF, but by virtue of shining that photon on it, we change the electron's momentum. We lose information about where it's going. It's not obvious which way it's going to go based on a collision. So if we don't want to affect the electron's momentum by observing it, we can choose a longer wavelength. In other words, it packs less energy. However, if we choose a longer wavelength, then we lose precision, pre precision in the electron's position because they're going to get more diffraction. And there's really no way around it. So this uncertainty, this inherent uncertainty also holds, oh, I'm sorry. So let's make sure we understand that. If I want delta x to be tiny, in other words, I want to know exactly where it is, then I'm going to get a big delta p because the act of looking at it is going to knock the electron off in an unpredictable way. If I want to have a small uncertainty of where it's going, then I need a longer wavelength, which means I know where it is less precisely. And so these two measurements are complementary. They have a fundamental limit into the precision I can know of one versus the other. Okay, and this is not an a, a, a outcome of our instruments of technology. This is fundamental to nature. And it turns out there are other pairings of, uncer of uh, uncertainty measurements. And another one that we're going to talk about very briefly is there's a uh, complementary between a particle's energy and time, that it has that energy. So we can express the uncertainty. There are other, actually, other ones as well, but we're not going to get into that. So here's a schematic of what I was talking about. Basically, we have a photon coming into electron. It through the Compton effect, you've got a scattered photon and a scattered electron, so we can know where it was at the instant, but we changed where it was, so we don't know where it's going. Anyway, so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be written as basically delta x times delta p is greater than or equal to, so that's talking about the uncertainty, okay? And it's a really, really small amount. As you imagine, it would be something to do with Planck's constant, and it's h over 4 pi. So we're not going to derive where the h over 4 pi comes from, but that's in your IB part of your reference table under topic 12. And then for the energy and the time, we have the same relationship. Okay, so again, this is not knowing... It's not saying we can't measure something's position exactly. We can, but by doing so, we lose information about its momentum. And how much you lose is this, which doesn't seem like a lot, but at the quantum level, it is fairly significant. Okay, now, we can look at this another way from a matter-wave standpoint. And this is perhaps, to me, the most convincing. So let's say we have a wavelength, or a wave, a matter-wave, that has a very precise wavelength, okay? And if it has a very precise wavelength, um, then it has a very precise momentum. However, it's spread out over a large delta x, if you will. In other words, if I ask you where is it, it's not really clear where it is. So if you want to get a, if you want to understand where a, a particle is, a wave particle, what you do is you take a bunch of wavelengths or frequencies and you mix them together so you get a sort of wave packet right there where it's very much more precisely defined where it is based on the amplitude. In other words, it drops off here and here, but we have a large amplitude there. But the problem with that is in order to create this superposition, right, the sum of all those, um, you need multiple wavelengths or multiple frequencies well, let's stick with multiple wavelengths. And if you have a lot of wavelengths, then by this relationship here, you don't know its momentum very well. So it's an interesting way of looking at this. It's a subtle way, but it's, a, it's a, probably the best way of looking at it. Okay, so I will do a follow-up where we look at the outgrowth of this called Schrodinger's equation, which is not something we have to solve, but it's a pretty weird idea.